Hey out there Akronites, welcome once again to Around Akron with Blue Green and do we have a lot of cool things to visit today. I'm going to talk to an Akron-centric photographer who loves to take pictures of the city of Akron. I'm going to learn all about the elegance of tea with the tea lady in downtown Akron. I'm going to head up to Highland Square to the new restaurant, Irie Jamaican Kitchen. And I'm going to visit and learn the history of West Hill Hardware and capture its last closing days. Now to kick this show off today, I'm going to meet up with an amazing photographer and he loves the city of Akron more than me, more than just about anybody I know. And his photographs prove it. Let's go see what Thomas Scala's photography is all about. As long as humans have been able to speak, they've been telling each other stories, right? Uh, and even, even back then, like there's art telling stories on cave walls, you know? It's like, this is the time we took down the mastodon. So, I mean, it's just, it's, it draws communities together. And also, uh, what I like to do uh, with photography, sometimes with comedy or storytelling, is that you could give people a different viewpoint, but, you know, in a really inoffensive way. It's not a debate. You're just sort of like, ah, oh, this is the way I see things, be it like with my eye or with my mind, you know? And it's just like, um, I think it increases understanding. When people give me feedback, like that also helps me too. It's not just a one-way thing. And, uh, you know, it's just like, it's, um, it feels good to share, share, pieces of the way you see the world with other people and they could share back with you and it just makes your world bigger. It's it's freeing in a sense to kind of like open yourself up to even strangers. But uh, it's also, it feels, it feels very human. Sometimes if I'm feeling like I'm stagnating a little bit, I'll give myself little homework assignments for a day or two. So like uh, one day I'll go out and like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pay attention to how like reflections work in Windows or in Chrome. Or another day, like there was one time I went out, I'm gonna, I just try to find ugly things that are beautiful. Or I'm gonna find ugly things and photograph them in a beautiful way. And it's, it's sort of like a little scavenger hunt, you know, sometimes. Uh, you know, like I'll, I'll just, like I, I like to find places and present them in a way that nobody's seen them before. And I mean, there's like, there's tricks that I often do with that, being like shooting straight down at something or shooting straight up, even like getting on uh, parking decks when the sun is at the right level and shooting straight down. So all you see is the top of a person, but then like you see what looks like an actual person so like uh, rather than people casting shadows, it comes like, it looks like shadows casting people, you know? And it's uh, just things like that where so many things you walk by on a, a daily basis that you never even take a second look at. But like, if you look carefully, it is, uh, there's a lot there. You could present it in an artistic way, even if it's just something simple, like a, just like a torn newspaper stuck in a fence or something. I would say, if you're gonna, don't, don't jump into it, wade into it. Uh, learn how to compose a photo first. Don't worry about editing right off the bat. Don't worry about like putting filters on to make it look good. Just, uh, just learn, learn how to compose a photo, like how to balance things, uh, always make sure what's in the background. Because if you're looking at something five feet away, you may not be paying attention that 20 feet away or whatever, something else going on. Make sure that everything's balanced. Uh, when I first started doing photography, I was doing black and white on film and doing my own processing of the film. And uh, because I was looking at the negative on the 35 millimeter film strip, you know, black is white, white is black. So like that already made the picture look a little foreign to me. And then I would like look at it backwards and turn it upside down just to make sure that like from an abstract point that it's still balanced. And like once you learn how to frame a photo and make sure that it's well balanced, I mean, then you could teach yourself editing. Uh, like I, I wish that I had focused on that more rather than trying to do both at the same time. We 
we all have great cameras in our pockets at all times. And like uh, kids growing up today could just end up being like the best photographers of any generation, except they'll only be good at taking photos of themselves in food. And if you like really think about it, like you just take a photo of anything that ever catches your eye. And you know, uh, if everyone's using their, their cell phones, which now have two or three or four lenses, I mean, you just, just it just takes a few minutes out of every hour if something catches your eye and you could like really like incorporate it into your life. And, and it's just like, maybe you'll enjoy it, maybe you won't, but you know, you could always try out. And the availability of quality digital photography to everyone is amazing. And I mean, it's just, it's such a great and easy way to get into it as a hobby or, or just a, you know, like a, a way to see things a different way yourself. Like it's just, it's, I mean, I recommend it to anyone. I mean, like, uh, and besides uh, when the pandemic started last year, you know, everyone's like, oh, I'm stuck at home. I'm like, I, I was still out hiking with my camera, you know, avoiding people, but you know, not a lot changed. You know, I, I miss seeing friends, but you know, I could still do something that brought me peace and happiness. And uh, you, you know, it's, it's just, it's always there. If you have a cell phone, you could do it if you want. Next up, I'm gonna meet up with Renee Woods Baylor, also known as the Tea Lady. And she's gonna teach me all about fine tea and the elegance that goes with it. I did throw tea parties with my sisters. I have two sisters and one brother. And uh, of course, I'm the oldest and the other ones are all younger than me. So it was easy to coerce them into coming to my tea parties. Uh, my parents had, uh, for Christmas, would give us this really nice room with furniture in it and with our teapots and everything like that. And I would just do tea parties when we were little. only time you'll have in the middle of the day to play with China and I just give them that opportunity to relax around it and experience it brings back the nostalgia of oh I remember my grandma or my great auntie or my mom and just everyone comes here when they see the settings it brings back memories and it's so amazing because they come together and they share that so they're sitting at the table, not just talking about what's going on in their day, they're talking about their mom, their grandma, just because of what I have on the table. It just brings back memories. Um, it's a great time to not have to invest thousands of dollars like I did. And you can just come here and have that experience with the fine china, the crystal, and the flatware is gold, is silver. I mean, it's just amazing. And it's like I did it, I had fun, I got to enjoy myself and bring back that touch of memory of a family member that's lost or gone. The tea that we have is fine tea and it's, it's very rare, it's not where you can just go into the grocery store and purchase this type of tea that we have. Uh, we have tea from wellness to hemp tea to CBD to herbal to white tea, green tea and black tea. It's a total different type of taste because normally people that drink, you know, teas from the grocery store, let's say Lipton or any other tea, they're pouring in the sugar, they're pouring in all kind of stuff. And what we ask is that you first try the tea. First take a sip because you may not need as much sugar or sugar at all based on the tea that we serve. And you know, the majority of people don't put no sugar. <laughs> They're used to putting half a gallon of sugar in their tea and they don't. They may put one scoop in and we have all types of different sugars too. So, and some of those sugars are handmade for us and we have them shipped in. So, you know, we try to make it where it's a mixture of different things we have where you can put a lemon in there or honey or orange slices and things of that nature just to enhance what you're already tasting. But the difference between that tea and buying it from the grocery store is like night and day. It is so fine 
the teas are the best that you can find around the world. I do give um, tea etiquette. I give etiquette around tea time, um, what things are used for, what's at your table, because there's so many different things at your table that really you're not used to seeing. And so I do point those things out. I do share how you sit, when you sit. I share how you unfold that napkin. It's just so many intricacies about tea time that a lot of people are just, they're, they're not used to. It's like taking the tea and just going like this with the bag. That's not how you steep the tea. Or even the terminology, steeping. Um, that's just usually putting that tea in a cup or a pot and letting it steep, let's letting it sit so that the herbs and everything that comes out of that tea that you actually get to taste. But I usually tell people to make sure it's covered because if it's just the hot air is going out, it's not, you're not really gonna get the full flavor. So make sure you use something that you can cover or a teapot and let your tea steep. That means to let it sit and marinate for three, three to four minutes or however long the tea requires you to, to let it steep to get the, all the flavors you want out of it. Study your, your craft. If, you, if it's something that you really, really love and you want to do it, put your whole heart in it. Don't do anything haphazardly or, okay, I'll just try to do it and expect perfection. Expect for it to go to the next level without really 200% of your involvement and your engagement and you putting the time in. I, 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 I personally believe if you don't write it down, it doesn't move anywhere, it doesn't go anywhere. My personal motto is if it's not written, it's not done. And I, I truly believe in it. Not only just thinking about it or dreaming about it, write it down. Sometimes when you put something in writing, it forces you to do something with it, to ignite it, um, to, to put some purpose behind it. So, you know, I would say to anybody young and old, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can be a kid and own a company. You don't have to be an adult. You don't have to wait till you're 21. There's no set age to creating your, your dream of your life. I did it when I was a kid, and I just kept on doing it till I'm here now today living in my dream in my latter years. This is my second chapter. I'm retiring from my old job and this is my new retirement and I'm loving it and I'm looking forward to it. Next up, I'm gonna go over to Highland Square and learn about a new restaurant with Chef Omar. His new restaurant is Irie Jamaican Kitchen. Let's go see what Chef Omar and Irie Jamaican Kitchen's all about. Uh, the word is airy. A lot of people say airy or, you know, but it's irate. You know, it's mean feeling good. It's a feel good word. Uh, you're having an airy day. This food is airy, you know. Life is airy. You know, I'm after the airy life. You know, good, a good life, you know, friendly. Just meet different people, having fun. It's enjoying life. What drove me to create Irie Jamaican Kitchen? Uh, I pretty much see a void in Jamaican food. I was been in the culinary business, working different restaurants, and I feel that I couldn't showcase my talent. So I feel there was a need for a Jamaican food. So that's how I created Irish Jamaican Kitchen. I'm from Trelawney. Uh, it's a little small town, you know, in Jamaica, what's on the countryside. Um, beautiful place but no, not a lot of job opportunities mostly like you know farming you know small town when everybody know each other you know just you know, small setting pretty much the same setting you know uh, you're not gonna get the roadside but you're gonna get the roadside cooking you know you're gonna get the authentic Jamaican food with freshness a lot of creativity um, you're getting it without the bone you know, so you're getting, getting straight from the heart from a Jamaican, you know. Um, I know the audience here in Akron weren't about the build out, looking so very good, the whole setting. So they're wondering if it's a real Jamaican food. 
Um, I would say yes, it is. You know, it's the best they're gonna have. I mean, it's the best they're gonna get, and they're gonna get it the way they've never seen them before. You know, this is the new level, so. You know, people always fear what they don't understand. You know, uh, this is a new, new era. You know, I think I'm creating a new era of Jamaican food, a new wave. You know, fast casual, fast friendly, uh, clean environment, friendly customer service, and just you know, just a lot of love. It feels great. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy that you know people are allowing me to share a part of me. You know, with them. You know. Um, I enjoy cooking. Uh, Jamaican culture is a beautiful culture, so I show my love to the food. You know, I, I, I'm giving them from the heart, just like a real Jamaican would. I started on the Richmond Mall a couple years ago. Uh, my restaurant name was Irie Jamaican Kitchen, so I was doing authentic Jamaican f food all the way to the bone. Um, it was good for a couple years, but you know, I think people wasn't aware of what Jamaican food was, so business didn't take off. So I, I decided to, to recreate the concept, where I go, I start doing bowls, boxes, uh, boneless Jamaican food, and it, it seems to. It was a better niche, you know, because I, I don't think people was aware of what Jamaican food was. They're a little scared to try it, you know, it was not very familiar in their eating habits. So I decided to take a, a different approach and create, recreate the brand. So what, what I did was I created four unique styles. Uh, we have the regular Jamaican style, we have the mac and cheese, and we got the seafood and the vegan style. So then the guests can move on to the protein, where we have the lamb, we have the oxtail, we got the jerk chicken, and we got the filet mignon. Then we can move on to the seafood, and we got baby lobster and jerk shrimp. We also got the vegan style, we can have vegan dishes. To top inside, create some very fresh salsa. We got the mango, mango salsa, um, homemade. We have the cucumber salad. We have the pineapple coleslaw and we have the fresh jerk salsa. I have some very highly flavored salsas. So I create a, a very uh, unique cilantro lime. Got mango chili with a little bit of spice. We also got the fire hot sauce if you're looking for more heat. And we got, the, um, we got the sweet and spicy if you're looking for a little bit mellow. I would say it's the combination of different nationality, you know, like, like Jamaica, it's, the culture and the food is like, you know, Spanish, African, and a little bit of British, so it's a combination of a lot of spices coming together. That's what Jamaica has, like, a whole bunch of different nationalities, different people, you know, that's, that's her model, you know, man. Out of many one people, that means it's people from all over the world, you know. It's, bring that, that whole, I would say that uniqueness to the highway. I promise when you walk in the door, Ari Jamaican Kitchen will be selling authentic Jamaican food. I 100% Jamaican. And I'm gonna bring you the culture, I'm gonna bring you the food, I'm gonna bring you the ambiance, and I'm gonna bring you the love. There's a lot of good Jamaican food out there, but it's, they're not hiring. You know, hiring is the, the next level, you know. Uh, we're giving you the freshness, uh, beautiful ambiance, friendly Jamaican, you know. What more can you want? You know, you're getting the whole package. It's kind of like going on a vacation, you know. Now to wrap this show up today, we're here at West Hill Hardware and learn about their 90 plus year run, three generations. I'm gonna sit down with Richard Chance and learn all about West Hill Hardware. Well, my very first memory, I suppose, was being carried uh, by my mother in her arms through uh, the one front door that we haven't used in years. And uh, I remember her carrying me in and they had big glass display cases that had, uh, oh, I don't know, displays. I remember they had a, a, a waterproofing uh, foundation paint display that had little floating ducks in it. 
And so I was a little kid, obviously, I remember that, but that's probably one of the first memories I have. My grandfather uh, started the business in 1930, and it was his third hardware. He had had two others before this one. One was at Five Points, called Five Points Hardware, and then he had one further up Copley Road on the corner of Madison Avenue that was community hardware. And then he sold those consecutively and then in 1930 opened this one, West Hill Hardware. It was a build to suit tenant option. And so he leased this building for several years until he eventually bought it. Originally it was two storefronts. One was a, a pool hall bar and grill sort of operation called the Valmar, Valley Market Grill, and then West Hill Hardware was in the largest of the two storefronts. And well, it was there until uh, somewhere in the 40s, I believe the, probably during the war period when there was a fire that broke out in it. After that, I guess my grandfather, he, he'd either bought the, the building before that or after that, but it, but it was never reopened, the bar part of it. And they eventually tore the wall down between the two uh, storefronts and made it one big, one big operation. First started working here in 1967. I was about 13 or so and uh, but that was just like, you know, after school, summer vacations kind of thing. And worked here all through, you know, junior high, high school, college. Um, but full time I started in 77, 1977. Probably took over really management maybe in somewhere in the 80s, like the later 80s, I believe. Because dad was... You know, he did a lot of the bill paying. Well, actually, Grandpa did a lot of the paperwork and bill paying, writing checks and all that early on. And then Dad did, you know, the bill paying and so on. My aunt and uncle, uh, my uncle Chick or Charles uh, and his wife Kitty did the billing. We used to have a lot of uh, charge counts where it was before the day of credit cards. And so there was a lot of... Uh, you know, like the home billing kind of situation, and Chicken Kitty did all that. Well, that's not a mural, it's a sign. And Akron Enlarging Arts made it. And that was uh, a blow up from a image that was Originally on a neon sign that was out front of the store in the sidewalk, there was a pole with a double-sided, uh, it was an enameled sign that had neon lighting on it and it said West Hill Hardware. And so I had photographed the image of one of the signs that was left. It was just a P, you know, this, the big sign board and, uh, and we graphically reduced it and worked with it to get down to that image kind of and then Akron Enlarging Arts made up that big sign. Yeah, well, we um, listed the building for the property, the physical property for sale about three or four years ago. And there's been, you know, several people interested in it as a space, but nobody, you know, was really interested in it as a hardware. You know, financially, it would be a, a marginal situation to get involved in unless you were really hooked up maybe on a corporate level or something and really managed it totally different than the way we ran this operation. You know, it, this worked because it existed and already been here for so long. Um, but at any rate, somebody finally did buy the building, and so we have to liquidate the interior now. And so there's going to be an online auction with the Kiko Auction Company. Just sort of a general thanks to uh, Vern, my, my friend Vern, who works here, uh, for all his help. and and and. A general thanks to 
to the community in general for supporting us for so long. Uh, and all the people that have worked here through the years, thank you. And sorry if I didn't mention you specifically, but, but I'd like to have a timeline with the names of everyone that worked here and when they worked here. And there's really been so many that I can't really put them all together at once or I forget, oh, that guy was here for a while or this person was here for a while or people that have all brought something, either good or bad maybe, <laughs> to the table. Uh, so I wanna thank those people too. Just a thank you, I suppose, you know. Thank you once again for watching this episode of Around Akron with Blue Green. Now, if you have any questions, comments, or you just want to drop me an email, you can go to www.aroundakronwithbluegreen.com or you can catch me on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on TikTok. Thank you and have an amazing day. Two, three, recording for you and me on Around Akron with Blue Green. All right, here we go. Hands on my pocket. Hey, you got my hands in my pocket. You can really see about right here, right? Somewhere? Yeah. Around Akron with blue green and once again. Yeah, that. Take this.